Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, this meeting is being recorded live and is streaming on the District of Summerland YouTube channel. Uh, all representations to council, written or verbal, will form part of the public record and be available to the public for viewing electronically or as a written record. Members of the public are encouraged to register their name and civic address in advance of the meeting for the public comment opportunity found under items six and nine by emailing corporate officer at summerland.ca. Those who have not registered in advance but wish to provide public comments may call the District of Summerland Conference Line at 1 877 385 4099 and enter participation access code 738 during the live meeting. Um, item two, uh, introduction of late items. Any late items? There are no late items. No late items, thank you. So if I could get a motion to uh, adopt the agenda, please. Councillor Barkwell, Councillor Patton, all in favor? That's carried. And a motion to adopt the minutes of October 13th. Uh, uh, Councillor Van Alphen, Councillor Carlson, all in favor? Carried. Uh, delegations, no delegations today. And so this is a, the public comment period. Is there anybody on the telephone who would like to comment on agenda items? None. Okay. So we'll uh, move on to the business items. 7.19719 Brown Street, business license application denial. I'll turn this over to our CEO. Thank you, Worship. And we've got the applicants in the uh, audience. So I'll do a brief presentation and provide an opportunity for the applicant to uh, provide a presentation to council um, uh, shortly. So I've got a couple of presentation slides just up on the screen to run the council and community through the proposed uh, uh, council uh, staff report. The subject property is located on the southwest corner of uh, Campbell. Uh, Crescent and Brown Street, as you can see up on the screen, the photograph in the top left hand corner showing the uh, view of the subject property. The OCP designation for the subject property is for low density residential intensification and the zoning is uh, currently institutional. On March 24th, a business license application was submitted for the property uh, on Brown Street by the applicant Jan Demers. The application described uh, the proposed use of the property as a healing center to be operated under the name New Approach Healing Center. Under the district zoning bylaw, the proposed use is defined as a group home major, which means that the use of the land, buildings, and structures for the provision of care as defined by the Community Care and Assisted Living Act for more than six residents, excluding staff, which are vulnerable because of family circumstances, age, disability, illness, frailty, and are dependent on caregivers for continuing assistance or direction. During the course of the review of the application, and as a result of the district's typical unusual business license uh, referral process, uh, the application was referred to the RCMP. It came to the district's attention that the applicant, Mr. Demers, was convicted of two, in 2007 of charges related to possession of stolen property and drug trafficking, trafficking specifically, possession of stolen property over $5,000, trafficking in controlled substance and conspiracy related to trafficking in controlled substance. Staff have reviewed the business license application and as outlined in the report, based on the analysis completed uh, to date and input received during the review process, I recommend the council deny the application. Given the express statement by the legislator, legislature that conviction after issuance of a business license of an offence indictable in Canada is reasonable cause justifying the cancellation of the license, it is reasonable to conclude that refusal of a license is not unreasonable, where the reason for refusal is that the applicant has, had, has previously been convicted of an indictable offence. The conviction of an indictable offence in relation to the matter that has some relation to the proposed business is particularly relevant to this consider, uh, application uh, consideration of the refusal and, can, and, and the staff consideration of refusal for this business license proposal. The applicant, Ms. Demers, is seeking to establish the business for the purpose of providing counseling and other services to individuals who have suffered trauma and addiction. Uh, needless to say, Ms. Demers 
proposed clientele represent a vulnerable portion of society who deserve to be protected from improper influence. Given Ms. Demas's, Demas's private convictions for possession of solar property and drug trafficking, there is an increased risk in staff's review that these individuals could be subject to improper influence. <clears throat> Close relationship between addiction and drug trafficking and stolen property cannot be ignored. In addition, it does not appear from the application that Ms. Demas has any particular expertise in relation to the provision of services to individuals who are at risk based on the information that was submitted to staff. And Ms. Demas has not provided, as I said, any information uh, provider in terms of who will be providing the service and what expertise those individuals have. As a result, based on the review completed by staff and in accordance with the district's business license bylaw, in the circumstance of this application, staff are recommending that council deny this application. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, I believe the applicant, Mr. Cabrera, would you like to say anything? Sure, is he asking me to speak on her behalf? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, if you could state your name and address, and then uh, I'm Neil Menard. I live in Kelowna. My address is uh, 500 Fleming. Um, okay, so yeah, we're looking at this this morning. Um, the reason I'm here, the reason that I guess I'm speaking with Jen for Jen is because she's helped me in my life. She's helped me change my life. I've known Jen for what, over five years now. Um, and uh, she, she, I don't know, I guess she thinks I'm a good speaker. We'll see if I do that today. But uh, yeah, she's helped change my life and she's been nothing but a good influence on me. So um, we've had people take a, a look at um, her prior convictions and this happened so over 15 years ago. Um, have you done anything? No. So she's been she's been good for 15 years. She she served her time. Um, she paid her debt to the community, and she, you know, I guess had a moment of clarity at some point during that process that made her want to change her life and help other people. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of address Mr. Haddad. So, what kind of investigation did you do um, on these charges against Jandamer? Did you? Yeah, no, I don't can, ask questions. Yeah, we can't ask questions of, of our staff. Yes, but we, 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 you can speak, if you could speak to uh, council. Absolutely. And then we'll, we'll take on board and I'm sure council will have lots of questions. Okay, I'm, I might stumble all over the place here. That's, so that's fine. my first time doing this. Um, <laughs> so from what we can see um, is that there wasn't a proper investigation done. Uh, we've spoken with an investigator um, numerous times, and again this morning. Um, and if the motion is denied, we're we're, we're we're gonna ask this investigator to come on board and become part of our team and, and help us push this thing through at some point because our, our goal, our purpose is to help people. Our purpose is not Jen isn't a criminal. You know, this, this happened in the past and she changed her life, and since then she's been able to change the lives of how many people? At least hundreds, I would say. Um, so yeah, okay, let's just look at the notes here. Um, so convicted in 2007, so this is 13 years ago. Um, you know, I, I just wrote some notes. Uh, and how many marijuana dispensaries have been given business licenses? And this was marijuana charge, by the way. How many marijuana license, uh, distribute, sorry, dispensaries have been given business licenses, although they have been charged in the past? You know, the conviction. You know, I imagine ninety percent. Um, I, I, so this is <clears throat> to a person that's recovering, to a person that's trying to recover from an addiction. Um, you need to be able to speak with someone who is understands the process or somebody that has had that life experience. And so I, I you know, as I look at that as a strength that Jan has gone through that and changed her life and, and become a the amazing woman that she is today. Um, what else did we get? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to tell you guys except for that Jan, like I said, I've known Jan for five years. She's done nothing but help me through some very difficult times in my life. She's provided me care. She's done it on trade for construction building at your other center. Um, she, she has a huge heart. She's never been a bad influence on me. She's been nothing but an amazing influence. Um, I've got, uh, you know, I'm one of probably a hundred or so people that
that I could point to anyways that would tell you the same story. Um, same, I'm a lot, but, uh, well, yeah, I just, I just love this woman. And, and you know, if I, if, I, I wouldn't put my name out there or give you my address if I didn't think that this was the case with her. You know? um, I think that there's a, hmm, I want to be the kind of person that, that, that accepts people's past, allows them the opportunity to change, and then, I don't want to say awards them, but congratulates them on being able to become a new person. You know? And so that's the kind of community that I want to live in. Um, these are the kind of people that I want to surround myself with people that, you know, do not discriminate based on someone's past, especially if they, you know, owned up to it at our company to that, right? And so we're not denying anything like that ever happened in, in our past. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to use that as a strength. So, I mean, I guess that's our only point. And, and, and I guess the only point of this flimsy article that was written this morning or yesterday um, and some other information is that she's a bad influence on people. And, you know, it's just not the case. Whatsoever, you know. Somebody asked me a question. Okay. Please. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, did uh, anybody on the council want to ask questions? Thank you. No. Oh, okay. Uh, Councilor Parkwell. Yeah. Councilor Council. I've got a couple of questions. I may have well. Yeah. You're doing fine. Yeah. That's a good as a, as a representative. You're, you're set. Set. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, I have a few questions that come up. Do you start off? Um, you wanted to ask about the type of investigation. Uh, that kind of implies that maybe the investigation wasn't um, thorough or complete enough. So, is there anything that you feel that uh, hasn't no been brought forward that you think should be? So, I think that people should. Um, if I was to conduct an investigation, I would not just take my information from either the Canadian government website and or uh, the internet at large. I would go and speak to people who have been in face-to-face -face contact with Jan. I would have um, in investigate or uh, I would have conversations with people that actually know her and have known her for a number of years. That hasn't happened. I don't think. Okay, so that's more about how it would be conducted, but not so much about the charges in particular. That should should sort of be presented. <clears throat> Jan, you want to say something about? These charges, um, what I was convicted of, were not the charges that were in question. I would like to have all my paperwork in order to, to say the exact thing and wording so that it's correct. Uh, we did meet with um, an investigator of 30 years within, within good standing of uh, communities. Um, I'm not a say who this person is. Um, that he feels that a thorough investigation should have been done regarding the nature of all of this. Um, it was all marijuana related. Um, having said that, there's so many different members of society that need our services. Uh, we've had a member of parliament, we've had numerous lawyers, nurses, um, teachers, it could go on and on and on. A member of uh, a lot firm in Penticton that numerously calls me even four o'clock in the morning. This person doesn't know how they're going to conduct the next day court stuff because of their addiction to crystal meth. This happens to everybody. This, this isn't just your neighbor's friend's son's cousin, wherever. This is right in our own neighborhoods. And this is close to my heart because of family members that have been so involved in addiction. I personally have never done drugs. I'm not a drinker. But I sure see the devastation in parents that phone me all hours of the night, doesn't matter if it's Sunday, Monday, or what day of the week, crying their heart out because their loved ones need help. Spouses, employers. I've, I've worked with CN, CP Rail, a big company that we just met with in Toronto that they're looking after their employees because this is so, so widespread. Good people making bad choices and they don't know how to get out of this mess. We're not here to sell drugs, get unsavory people sitting outside and uh, causing a ruckus. You would never see that. These are people that want to get treatment, want to get better, want to have good life. It's not um, 
somebody sitting on the doorstep with a bottle of whiskey and screaming and hollering or a heroin addict laying on the side of it with a needle hanging out of their arm. This, is, this isn't the case. And I think we need to get a, the awareness out there so that people don't have this stigma with addiction, that this can happen to anybody in life. You, you don't have to be a street level person. That member of parliament that was scared to get on that plane was scared skinny, not because of getting on the plane, but be, because of the stigma attached to this and that they'd be recognized. So I, I think we all have to just take a look and how can we help this whole situation instead of hinder it? I, I don't personally think it's fair to a lot of people that do want help that can't, into, they can't get into government funded places for six weeks. When somebody wants help, they want it now, not next week, next month. So I don't know what more to say. Um, I own my stuff that I've done. I'm not proud of it, but you know what? I'm pretty proud of the shoes I'm standing in today. And if it wasn't for all of that out there, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. So, I mean, you can slam me for whatever you want, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna hold my head up proud and know that I'm doing something good for maybe one of your children, maybe one of your spouses, maybe somebody you know. So, I don't know. Thank you. Um, Dr. I just have one quick question and it's about, um, my understanding is you currently operate a facility called Beyond 12. Yes. Um, and I would like to know the facility that you're wanting to operate in Summerland, um, will there be detox? Will there be court mandated patients or clients at this facility? We will not do detox at this facility. We would detox it at Salmon Arm if we have to. Uh, absolutely no court mandated. Um, we did a lot of court mandated for a while and um, it got to the point where I guess I was everybody's get out of jail ticket and I always wanted to see the good in everybody and know that incarceration wasn't a form of treatment. So I'd be running to everybody's rescue. Well, that didn't serve me so good because pretty soon the RCMP was looking at it that this was a little bit shady. I did have a meeting with the RCMP in Salmon Arm and um, at that moment on, we did not no longer take any court mandated, and I will not again, which is a shame because there is people out there that do want help, and there's those that have kind of put a, a barrier in that. So, no, we would not do court mandated, and we would not do detox. And so, just to, to follow on that then, so you're, you have a facility that will have people in it that would are are looking at getting better and are trying to get better. Um, you will be the owner of this facility. Um, I assume that that's not with a whole bunch of other family members. And I'm wondering um, who else is going to help you run that facility? Well, for the moment, um, I mean, which we will hire more staff. We have a, a site manager per se. Uh, she's in long-term recovery and um, she also is a legal secretary. So she's got a good background. And uh, we've got Tara is my head counselor and uh, program manager. So we would use the same programming at, at um, Summerland. Um, support staff, we would be able to bring, because everybody works two on, four off, we would just enhance their hours as to here. And most likely start, start within the community of hiring people from around here. And, and Jesse, the, our other counselor, would also come down and, and do counseling until we could foresee. I'm not a counselor. I don't want to be a counselor. I don't act as a counselor. Um, for, for it to be said that I'm, I don't have any um, knowledge of all this kind of work, that's very incorrect. And really, I took that very personally. Um, my whole thing is that I work with the families because my family has got some strong addiction issues within some of my loved ones. So I'm there for the families. I answer the phones. I go out and do interventions. In six years now, there's only one client that I went out to do an intervention that I did not bring back. 
So I think I've got a pretty good track record on with with what I do and, and what my role in all of this is in marketing, answering the phones, talking to the, the families and the loved ones, meeting with them, and then they take it to the next step, which is the counselors, the support staff, um, all these different things within. So that's my role in this. Thank you, Jen. That's helpful for clarification. Thank you, Councillor Vanell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd first of all like to thank Jen and uh, Tara for meeting with me last week. I really, truly appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, it really clarified a lot of things for me. Um, I think there is, you know, there is uh, issues in our society when you start talking about a treatment facility, first thing they think about is detox centers and this and that. This is not what this is. It's a treatment facility, it's not a detox center. Um, when you said you took offense to some comments made about training, I'm looking here, do you have five or six different certificates in intervention? Uh, five, well, I think there's six actually. Okay. So and it's ongoing, I'm forever taking more and more. And I work under a lady that has uh, Can-Am interventions and uh, she's my mentor. And she's out of the States and Canada as well. Thank you for that. And if I may, one more question through to our CAO. Um, if I could ask you a question. Did you contact the City of Salmon Arms, the planning department, and was there any complaints against their facility in Salmon Arms? Yes, so uh, through Chair, if you worship. So we did reach out to the District of Salmon Arms, the District of uh, Salmon Arms. The facility is located in the regional district. Not in Salmon Arm, so they do not. The regional district does not have a business license process, so they do not go through the same process uh, to get a license as uh, districts. So, but they did not have any uh, complaints within their planning department. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ching. Hi, thank you for coming today. Um, so my question is just going to follow up on Councillor Van Alpens a little bit. Um, have you, with your facility that you have in close to Salmon Arm, have you ever had any issues with bylaw or with the RCMP there? Um, the only issues we've ever had when RCP come out is when we had court mandated and they would have to check on, on I guess, their clients as well as, as our clients uh, do curfew checks. Um, there has been the odd occasion where we've had to call them to remove somebody because ours is absolutely zero tolerance for drugs or alcohol. So otherwise you haven't had any issues with the regional district bylaw at all? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and then my second question was, do you ever work with Interior Health at all? We are in the process of becoming assisted living, which we're, we're really happy about that. Um, we used to be Interior Health licensed, and then we chose to go un-Interior Health licensed. Um, now we're going assisted living, which will give us a few more things that we can do. So the facility in Summerland, you're working towards getting licensed. Well, um, we would probably go assisted living as well. I and haven't taken interior health. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I haven't taken any of those steps <coughs> yet because I feel like I would be jumping the gun at this point. So once once we have everything sorted out, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions for uh, <coughs> Councillor? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I know this might be a hard question to ask. Uh, you talked about. Um, Uh, when they came in for the treatment, what what is the average stay, or what is the current turnover of your uh, clients uh, in Salmon Arm, and what what would we be expecting in Summerland? So we offer a thirty day program, forty two days, sixty or ninety. We would not be offering any um, second stage, which means long term. Uh, the best program that I personally like to promote is the forty two days. It just gives a person a little bit more clarity. I mean, kind of getting your head out of the fog after the first couple of weeks. That is the one that we would really like to promote. Sometimes too long is not good either. So it's kind of like, you know, at the end of 30 days or 42 days, they meet with the counselors and, and see where they're at in their journey. And most of these people, they're blue collar, white collar people. They can't be away for a long period of time. So it gets pretty intense with 
what they have to work on so they can get back to their jobs, their careers, and their families. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, your application speaks to um, counseling with people with addictions and post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, how do, are the two related? And would you have clients with both of those issues at the same facility at the same time? Yes, we feel that if you've heard of Dr. Gabor Mate, the big thing with addiction usually is pain and trauma of some kind, which has led to addiction, which has kept somebody in addiction. That's usually the case. So instead of just doing a quick 12-step program and you're out the door, I'm not dissing the 12 steps, but we go beyond the 12 steps. So getting to the root of why somebody's in addiction and what's keeping them in addiction. And usually it's childhood pain and trauma of some kind. Not saying always, but usually. So um, currently or previously that facility was um, a retirement center. And uh, you're involved with some retirement centers as well. I understand that right. There is a, um, a notice for uh, with your name um, uh, had to be certified with Interior Health or something. I'd have to look at it again. No. Are you are you maybe talking about our place in uh, Salmon Arm? Well, yeah. Yeah, that's where we're in the middle of. Uh, of, of becoming in, interior health assisted living. Maybe that's what you're thinking. And, and changing it over from an addiction center or? No, just, it, it's always opening been. a new center? No. Oh, just. Councillor Barco, I think, just sorry to interrupt, I think that having this facility for addiction is considered assisted living. If that's a question. Yes. 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 Right. So um, not for the elderly then, there wouldn't be a mixture of elderly no. people? No. No. Although we get quite a few elderly people that are in addiction of some kind. And also another big thing that's so across the map now is prescription dependency. You know, which is, is really sad because some doctors have prescribed medications that people just cannot get off. And, and where does that go down the road? It's just, it becomes a real bad vicious cycle for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And also in the elderly. And so how did you happen to pick Summerland as a place to open business? Actually, I was presented with this building about six years ago. And at that point in time, somebody else stepped in and the owner of the building wanted to keep it as a senior's place. A year and a half ago, this gentleman searched me out again. And he said, my building is coming up again. He said, I really want you in there. And I couldn't have been happier because it is such a perfect building for this. It's it's smaller than what we have. It's um, very personable. I myself worked in Summerland in long-term care when I first took my long-term care aid course in, I think it was 1982. And I worked at Parkdale Place and I always liked Summerland. So when this opportunity came out, I was really happy about it. So it wasn't just because it was Summerland. It was... It was the whole, it was the whole package deal. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Lairns? Okay, thank you very much for um, coming forward and telling us. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Does anybody like to, uh, Councilor Patton? Questions for staff? Yes, please. Councilor Patton? Go ahead, Councilor. Okay, if I may, um, I mentioned it to Jan and I asked her a question through our CEO. I asked our CEO, we could award this business license to this group and we can also revoke it at any time. I mentioned that to Jan last week and if I may speak on your behalf or you can speak on your own behalf, you would be, if you would be welcome that. Absolutely. Is that correct? Absolutely. So, I would think nothing I would not think a good thought if the city of Summerland would let things go unnoticed or not taken care of for the community. So if we had a whole bunch of bylaw infractions and or our CMP concerns in the future, it could come back to the council table just so everybody's on the same playing field and we all know where we're heading here. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
This is for CAO. Um, do you know currently um, if there are any open files with the RCMP? Uh, not to my knowledge. Thank you. Councillor I'd like to put the motion on the table if I may. Yeah. Councillor Carlton, do you have a question? No, I was going to make a motion. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Benoff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Council approve the business app license application request for 9719 Brown Street, Lot 1, District Lot 474, So Use Division EL, District Plan 5297. Accept plan KAP 72165 for a group home major. And second, Councilor Carlson. Any discussion? This is a motion to approve the group license. So, uh, Councilor Barco, um, just to comment that this is a tough call. But I think what uh, decides it for me is Councilor Van Elphin's point that uh, if there's problems in the future, then the whole decision can be revisited. And I think that uh, will provide some assurance to people in the community who are uh, uh, concerned. Councilor Carlson. Um, just a comment that I, I too have met with Jan and her team. I've toured the facility and I know it's a difficult thing to talk about treatment and addiction and troubles, but I know that um, they're, sorry. I think it's a good thing for a town. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a couple comments, if I may. You know, since COVID, we've had more fentanyl deaths in British Columbia than COVID deaths. You know, so it, it tells us something what's going on in our society out there, and it's we're you know it's a, it's a, it's an epidemic in itself, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, these type of things. I mean, I've been involved or seen and know people that have worked in treatment facilities, in a lot of treatment facilities. And correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the counselors are ex addicts, ex recovering alcoholics. You know one person helping someone else who knows their problems, who you know, have walked a mile in their shoes. Um, there's one thing about alcohol and drug addiction, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care if you're black, white, blue, green, RCMP, doctor, lawyer, doesn't matter. It happens. You know, I lost a nephew two summers ago and then kicked him that fentanyl overdose. I just had a friend, I uh, lost her son three months ago. You know, it, you know, it's a pandemic of its own. And, um, you know, I, I, I commend you and I hope you all the best success. I'm hoping in the future that, um, you know, there could be more done, you know, maybe some workings with the high school, talks with kids, you know, young people, you know, having some public engagement processes where, you know, when people are curious, um, there might be some education and enlightenment for people because this isn't, this is a disease or the, you know, this is a problem in our society. And it's one of those problems that people want to keep the door closed. They don't want to tell anybody. They don't want to tell you that their son is addicted or their daughter is addicted or their dad or their mom or their grandchildren. So, I mean, the thing is, every time someone does recover, they become a productive part of society not a burden of society. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Councillor Patton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is to uh, our CAO. Um, I know that Councillor Van Elken and Councillor Parker have spoke of revoking the business license if it, was, if it went south. Uh, the question being that I would have is if the uh, we did issue a business license, it went in, it was going to be revoked. What happens then? What is the process if um, there's clients within that building and now we're revoking the business license? Uh, through the chair, your worship. So similar to the denial, uh, staff do not have the ability to uh, 
council or license, we have to come to council for that process. So there would be obviously advance notice of the application coming to council uh, for a request to have it revoked. And the same um, opportunity for the business owner would be there to speak to council on that issue as well. So there'd be more than ample time. And then depending on the decision of council, then there'd be a timeline, for example, maybe a 30 day, for example, 60 day timeline to uh, uh, close the business down if that had to happen. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Chair. Um, I'm going to be voting in favor of this. Um, I'm definitely willing to give it a chance. Um, I think that Ms. Um, Rummer, if I'm saying your last name, sorry, uh, she has, you know, she's run a business successfully in Salmon Arm for several years, and I think that that um, speaks to um, her experience. Um, I think that the conversation that we've had today, as well as her presentation and the questions that have been um, asked by other councillors, has given me a lot of confidence and, and hope for this project. And um, we have future options um, if, for some reason, um, it didn't work out. And so I think that this um, this type of facility fills a large gap in our community, um, which we all know is there. So um, I hope that it works out. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, then I'll call the question. All in favor of uh, approving the business license? Any opposed? None opposed. No motions carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 7.2, fire sparked. Uh, well, I'll turn this over to our fire chief. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, before council is a um, request to support a UBCM grant. Uh, the grant is for $150,000. Uh, there's two portions to that grant. One is a um, fire smart uh, educational component that amounts to about $15,000. Uh, that would um, enable us to have a, a fire smart dedicated web page that could be tied to our municipal website, as well as um, a link through a Facebook uh, page, again, through our municipal website. Uh, another component of the Fire Smart Educational pro, uh, portion of that grant application is for a um, educational garden, if you like, or landscaping display at the Southern Recreation Center in the arena uh, to remove those concert trees and deciduous, or not deciduous, and coniferous uh, plants that are there and replacing the fire smart material. So that's under the 15000 um, But the larger portion is for $137,000. And as council is aware, we're um, um, in the process of a rewrite of our community welfare and protection plan. Um, I have yet to see the initial draft, but I have been working with the consultant on it, and I think it's coming soon. Um, in that draft, they have identified 21 areas that we would like to look at doing field treatment on within the municipality. Um, most of those are municipal land. There are some crown land areas as well. Um, we're looking at 408 hectares of land to be treated. So it's, it's quite a large piece <laughs> or a, a lot of work to be done there. Um, this grant though, will only address uh, 203 hectares. Uh, and uh, with what has to happen is there has to be a prescription done for each of the blocks that we're proposing. So that will identify the work that needs to be done, the thinning, the densities that will remain, how to remove the fuel, taking into account environmental aspects and all those things. Um, the prescription to be done in 2021 with the treatment of those uh, nine plots in 2022. So if we're successful with the grant application, um, it's likely we may see um, some treatment work starting in the fall of 2021 and continuing into 2022. The condition of the grant application is that uh, council uh, resolution supporting the application be submitted to the BBCO. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Councilor Barkwell. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, on the map here, um, 
So those, I don't know how many we have. Like, where, what, where's your priorities? Where's your first so priorities and, or your biggest risk areas? Yeah. If the, the CAO could bring up the uh, the next slide or the next <coughs> uh, the PDF yeah. document. So those are the 21 total. I think it's Councillor Barkles identifying there um, in this document here. So I apologize for the clarity of this. It's a scan of a scan of a scan yes. and with a red Sharpie identifying the <laughs> yellow areas. Um, not too technical, but we're fire guys. So um, <laughs> the yellow mustard areas are, are in all the areas that have been identified as needing treatment. The ones that are outlined in red are the ones we're proposing to, tr to treat with this application. So it includes uh, a portion of Giant's Head, um, Little Giant's Head to the south of the Giant's Head there. That was treated in, 20, or in uh, about 1999. It's up for retreatment. Uh, the cell tower lands would be immediately to the left of that. Then as we continue along, there's a section of Conical Mountain, then out towards again on Conical Mountain, out towards the rodeo grounds, in, encompassing the rodeo ground lands. And then if we go due north of that, Prairie Valley West, there's a large section there, the Trappers Flats area that, that rolls up into the uh, Deer Ridge area. And then uh, there's one small portion out in Canyon View, and then one section out at Garnet Valley Dam that was not influenced by uh, the Enius Mountain Fire in 2018. So when we add all those up, we're about 200 hectares that we're identifying for treatment. I think that's part of it. So is this an all or nothing kind of application? We'll get all those nine areas or we won't get anything? Uh, through the chair, yes. For, for funding. For funding, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just have a, I guess, a question, why do we have to apply for a grant to do field management on Crown land? Shouldn't Crown just be, uh, shouldn't we just be billing the Crown for, for the work we do on their land? Uh, Your Worship, it is, it is all funded. It's 100% funded. It's just Crown land is eligible for the funding as long as it's managed through a municipal government or through an agency like a municipality. Private land is not eligible for the funding, but they allow First Nation land, Crown land, and, and municipal land to be funded. The, these, these Crown lands fall within our municipal boundary, so it kind of falls back onto us to manage them in that fashion. Any uh, further questions? Uh, I'm going to bring a motion forward. Carlson. I'll move that the application to the UBCM Community Resiliency Investment Program Fire Smart Community Funding and supports in the amount of $150,000. Second by Councillor Van Elfman. Any discussion? I'll call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Uh, 7.3 Giants Head Road upgrades. Uh, I'll turn this over to our Director of Works and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will just get a presentation up on the TVs here in a moment. Um, while that's happening, I'll just introduce Mike Owen from Associated Engineering, who's here with us today to help with the presentation. Uh, Mike's been heavily involved with the design on this project. Uh, so he'll be here to speak on the design details and answer any questions that council has. So Giants Head Road, um, this project is spanning from Harris Road to Hillborn Street. Uh, it's about 2.6 kilometers. Um, today we're going to go over just quickly some of the background material, why we're doing this project, what brought it forward, why, why is it a priority. Uh, Mike will run through the design summary on the water main replacements, um, the, the system separation, looking at the roadway improvements with the pathway extension that we're looking to do along Giants Head Road, and then touching on any land or easement issues that have been flagged during the detailed design process. Uh, at the end, we'll talk about the, uh, the cost estimates, and then there's a flyover video as well that will about a minute long that we'll run, over, run, run through at the end of this uh, presentation. So the purpose of this project, obviously, if anyone's driven down that road, it's in very poor condition. Um, the, the issue is beneath the surface as well. There's water mains in there that are from the 1930s and 1970s. Uh, the system isn't separated, so it's it's all a combined system. It's interconnected. 
Uh, there are two mains out there, but like I said, they are interconnected and do provide water, both domestic and irrigation to all those properties. Um, there's also a separated pathway that comes along Giants Head from Prairie Valley um, on the one side, which we would be looking to extend as far as we can down Giants Head Road. Um, based on this, the design work that we've done so far, we can extend it down to Gartrell to the Y. And then from that point beyond, we'd be looking at shoulder lanes on either side, and we'll go through those details a little bit later. So some of the information on the existing water mains, like I said, 1930s, 1970s pipe. Uh, this is a picture of a, of a water main up from um, Quinpool Road this past year. It's a four inch line that was restricted to about two inches with the, the buildup on the inside, just due to the age of the pipe and the reaction that happens between the water and the pipe material over time. So we'd be looking to replace, uh, completely replace these, these two mains that are down Giants Head Road we would be abandoning them in place and installing new water mains in a new alignment. With the road structure itself, we, we've taken a look at what's there. Um, asphalt varies from, from a couple inches to, uh, to over 10 in some areas, uh, but very little base. So it was basically placed on the native material that was there. So we'd be looking during this one, we're going through and doing the water main replacements. We'd be reconstructing the entire road with uh, from the gravel base materials up to the asphalt and taking care of any drainage issues along the way that have been flagged in our master plans. So that's some of the guiding documents that we've included in this review. So the water master plan looking at the system separation uh, for this area. This is the next largest separation area that will take a load off of our water treatment plant now that we've done Prairie Valley and we've done uh, Garnet Valley Road. This one will take about five megaliters per day off of our treatment plant system once it's fully separated. So right now we run upwards of 80 to 85 megaliters a day in the summer with all irrigation on. Um, with the reductions in Garnet Valley and Prairie Valley, that's we haven't seen a peak over 80 in the last few years. Um, so this would reduce that even further. And our design of our water treatment plant, I believe is 70 megaliters per second. So anything over that, we're, we can push beyond that, but it's pushing the limits of the system. And it gives very, very little time to react to any breakdowns or issues within the plant if we do have any issues. So um, this is a, a good next step for that. And so it's providing an untreated water to this area for irrigation, which obviously saves on the, the treatment costs and process of this water if it doesn't need to be. Um, the drainage master plan, there was, I think, three projects that were flagged along this road that we would incorporate. Uh, some, some work at White Street. Uh, as well as some work near the Y to divert the water towards the to the east uh, into some existing drainage corridors there. And then more recently, the cycling master plan was completed. And that's the picture that's on the slide here to show uh, the extension of that separated pathway to the Y with Gartrell Road. And then from that point beyond looking at a secondary route for bike lanes, which would be shoulder lanes that we're proposing in this design. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike to go through the design, and then I'll jump back in at the cost estimates section. All right. Thank you. Um, so for the design, uh, we're so domestic water and irrigation water currently comes down Giant's Head Road from the north. Um, we're replacing, as I said, 80-year-old 80 domestic and 45-year-old irrigation uh, water mains. Uh, the water main for domestic is uh, is currently a 150 cast iron and will be replaced as a 150 PVC. And as far as irrigation goes, it actually downsizes, it steps down along Garnet Valley or Garnet Valley at Giants Head Road uh, at a 350. It starts at 350 at Harris and goes down to about a 300 at Garth Trail and then 250 from Garth Trail down to a 150 at Hillborn. So it steps down as the demand decreases and the irrigation system uh, the pressure zone actually ends at Hillborn so that's where the line will actually tee into the domestic and uh, stop at that point okay and then as far as the uh, road cross section goes uh, for Giants Head from Harris to Gartrell we're proposing a similar style of path as what's there um, for, the, uh, for the section we're tying into so a three meter wide path and uh, two, two lanes, uh, 3.6 meters each, and then a half meter asphalt shoulder between the curb and lane. Um, 
current road width in this section is about six and a half to seven and a half meters wide. Um, so we're just over that current uh, proposed proposed lane width. And yeah, and as far as the uh, rebuilds, the proposal is for to pulverize the existing road structure uh, with with base gravel, place some more base gravels on top, and then pave on top of that to uh, utilize the uh, existing road structure and uh, not have to haul material away, haul the material away. We just want to get, uh, get the best uh, best bank for buck kind of things. And then as far as from Garfield to Hillborn goes, uh, through this section, it's very tight with property lines and uh, power poles. I don't see a fly over uh, video, but we don't have the room for the uh, same uh, multi-use paths in this one. So we're proposing two 3.9 meter lanes and 1.5 meter shoulder or uh, bike path, walking path, one on each side, um, which gives the uh, 10.75 meter uh, uh, road, road width through this section. And yeah, existing in this section is, is the same, about six and a half to seven and a half. And this is just one of our typical uh, typical sections uh, around around Harris Road. Um, we're going to be tying in each of the driveways because the road will have to be raised typically about a foot or so. So we'll have to chase some of the driveways a little bit. But typically, we'll be chased past past property line at this point, and then the path between the section we have a lot of power poles to, to manage. So. It's been set as a standard width of three meters, but uh, it does narrow or adjust a little bit as we go around around some of the power poles. We actually have power poles on, on both sides. Uh, as far as the intersection with Gartrell, uh, the main flow of traffic will remain, remain the same, where the uh, giant side of Gartrell, Gartrell the giant side is the main, the main flow route, um, but the intersection will be cleaned up a little bit here how we're, how we're tying in the path with uh, crosswalks and uh, into, the, uh, into the bike path and shoulder, shoulder section. And in this section, this is where we're also proposing uh, some drainage with some uh, catch basins and uh, so forth to deal with the, uh, deal with the drainage through here. And then as far as the next section from Gartrell to Hillborn, this is where Said we don't have a whole lot of room due to uh, power poles and property constraints. So uh, we're, yeah, we're basically threading the needle through this section. Um, and then, as far as uh, land acquisitions and working easements, so there's two sections uh, with four properties that we require working easements where the toes of our slopes project past, uh, past property line. They're typically half a meter to three meters in width, so not not that far. Um, but just where we'll need to regrade some of that where the roads won't have for extending out a little bit. That and then there's one location with two properties where we'll need uh, a little bit more property. I think it's I checked before, and it's 1.5 to two meters in uh, in width of these properties that uh, we'll need to get the the typical cross section through here. And then there's one drainage easement that's shown uh, uh, just uh, just north of the Gartrell intersection. That's a low point with uh, no way to get out. So we need to get the uh, runoff from the road to the uh, to the ravine in between the back side of the property there. So um, this table was a, was a an attempt to show what the full project costs are if done as a whole, um, but also providing some cost examples uh, for council if, if, the, if this project was to either be broken up and done separately, if we were to just do the water mains and patch the road above that was disturbed. That's what's shown in option three. Uh, option 2A was if we were just going to go ahead and do the, the road improvements as per this design, so extending the path, widening the road, but not touching any of the underground infrastructure. Um, option four was just if we weren't going to touch the road or the water mains and just extend the, the uh, pathway, the separate pathway down the shoulder, down the one side and then widen the road from the Y south to get shoulder lanes on, on the road. Um, and then 2B was to give an option to, 
to the road design. And if we were just going to look at repaving this road, not do anything else, not do the pathway, not do any drainage improvements, not do any water main, just go ahead and pulverize the existing road at the existing width and, and repave it on top. Um, that was the intent of, of 2B in this, in this table. So just to give you some perspective on, yeah, we're looking to combine this all and do everything at once because that it you know makes sense and it's cheaper than doing these individually. I think if you totaled up two, eight, three, and four, you'd be close to 7.7 .7 million if you were to do them separately. So by combining them, we have obviously some we're not duplicating some of the road work and some of the site work. Um, but it is always an option to just to go ahead and look at the resurfacing and, and not worry about the water mains right now. However, in the long run, we will be back in there doing the either the system separation or the improvements to that water system. So um, and then as part of the 2021 budget, we will be looking to separate this project cost into the water fund and the general fund. Uh, to date, it's been shown a $6 million project in the general fund. Uh, the water main portion should be allocated to the water fund, which it will. Um, not to complicate matters, but when that happens too, we will be looking at the upstream works from this project site. So between this site and the water treatment plant. There are a number of areas, I think there's five in total, where there will be some level of water main work to actually separate the source water that's coming to Giants Head Road. Um, if we want to have a, just this project, yes, this area would be separated, but the water coming to it would not be. So those, uh, those works are being designed right now. Uh, preliminary estimate is about 1.5 million of the upstream work that's required to separate the water to Giants Head, and then this project would be separated within this area. So with that, that's the conclusion of the presentation. We're just going to show a one-minute flyover, starting at Hillmore and going north up to Harris, and then we'll open up any questions from council. <laughs> yeah, so this is the section, obviously, where there's shoulder lanes on either side. That's just with the light gray, what that's paving them with. And showing the, the tight corridor with the power poles on, on both sides. Um, it's the, the telecommunications on one side and the forest transmission on the other. And at the intersection here is where it breaks into the separate pathway on the west side. And there are sections where the poles will lie within the pathway. Uh, we've ensured there's a minimum clearance on, on either side. Um, or on, oh, sorry, on one side to make sure that there's no issues with, uh, with pedestrian traffic. And then coming up to Harris, where we will tie into the existing cross section to, to match this and finish the project. So with that, in, uh, Council, if there's any questions, Mike and I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Pott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Chris, can you tell me um, the amount of breaks we've had on Giants? Uh, I'm just I'm just looking at the six million compared just to resurface it. We have a lot of projects coming up, as you know, in the next few years, big dollar projects. And have we had some significant um, uh, costs and related to broken water mains uh, on Giant's Head at this point? No, we haven't. Not, not with regards to water mains, no. Thank you. Councilor Carlson? So you showed us a picture of a very rusty pipe. Um, is there risk in drinking water that comes out of those cast iron pipes? No, water across the system is tested every week uh, in various locations for various parameters. Um, so the issue that you will run into with those is flow. Uh, and, and in Quinpool, we were seeing uh, risks of low fire flows out of the hydrant. So if there was a fire in that area, um, that was that was the driving force behind going ahead and getting Quinpool done. Um, it's just, and so that's just an example of what you may see in the water mains here. It's very contingent upon the, the actual uh, mineral, minerals and what's within the water that's, that comes to this area. Um, but we suspect 
it's likely similar, but we haven't seen the fire flow issues because we have the larger irrigation main that's there as well to feed the hydrants. Okay, thanks. Um, I just have a question. Uh, so, so I understand the advantages of doing the full project in, in one go, but uh, would we be able to do that with the full project in phases over uh, a number of years, for example? Um, we initially, I think it would probably recommend that maybe you look at doing the full reconstruction, but only on a portion. So maybe going to White Street or maybe going to Garchell Road. Uh, and not doing the, and then doing the section beyond at a later date. So not necessarily doing the water main for the whole stretch at once. And then, so yeah, it would be more of a, of a staggered approach. You'd work your way down the road, doing the full reconstruction as you go, if you're looking to break up the cost over a number of years. And you can do that with, in, in with one contract, but over a number of years. Yep. Um, and um, can you just explain, uh, what, what it means that you have two mains, but they're interconnected. That means they're joining together sometimes and coming apart sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. So they're yeah they they they're both with treated water at this point. So yeah, there's just exactly there's pipes that connect that cross connect the two mains at different locations, or, or the, the, at, at certain some locations where it's not fully separated from one to the other, which it would be after the project we'd ensure that the untreated irrigation water was completely separate from the treated domestic. So, so what's the, what's the history of why why are there two mains right now? I believe it was just due to the timing of the install. So, um, the domestic, I believe, was, was the earlier. Yeah. So, in the 1930s, main was the initial main that was put out there. Uh, so, in the 70s, when when the Arda projects were on to extend the irrigation, they went ahead and put in the second main, and they were cross connected at certain points. Yeah. Yeah. And and this uh, one other thing is is, is uh, do you have any a feel on what sort of grant opportunities we might be able to tap into? And how optimistic would we be for any portion? Yeah. So we looked at the uh, the federal gas tax fund back, I believe it was in 2018, uh, and applied for the full $6 million project and we're not successful. Um, the recent ICIP grants that have been out, we've had this project as a, as a potential project that we've discussed with the ministry, um, but because it's it's basically a, a road reconstruction and water main replacement project. There's been uh, little interest in promoting this one as the top priority for the district. It doesn't meet a lot of the, the outcomes that those programs are looking for. Uh, we have tried um, or considered looking at components of it. So the active transportation piece and, and getting at some funding for the pathway section perhaps. Um, but yeah, as far as as far as a road and water main replacement project or a system separation project, there's not a lot of funding specific for that. You're competing with other large projects, municipalities that don't have a water treatment plant that are looking to construct one or, or wastewater treatment plants that are that are failing and not meeting requirements that are, are getting the mon money and the funding versus what they see these ones as more as uh, maintenance projects. Oh, good train. Um, Chris, I think had mentioned something about uh, the active um, like recycling component of it that, that might qualify for uh, one of the green grants that's coming up. Because was like there one more? Like we already looked at two grants in October, but there was like one in November. And I think you guys were going to see a portion of this project could qualify for that because it was the recycling. Yeah, so there's the CERIP grant that's out right now. It's uh, that one's due. I believe that one's due this week or in November. Anyway, yeah, so those ones were, they weren't specific to active transportation. They were sort of to tourism or to destination. Um, Could the recycling component of that possibly qualify of the, the project? Probably not very strongly. Um, because that's a pretty um, active cycling path, especially when it comes into all the wineries and Giant's Head. And the runs that we do every year along there. Yeah, there's there's also the bike BC grants that have been out annually for the last few years. Um, it's a, and, and those ones again are geared, they're sort of geared towards more of the commuter bike traffic versus the recreational. But it definitely will will review that CERP grant to see if there is an option. Sometimes it's like you sold like either tourism or commuters because it, it links our our community like two ends and and then definitely the tourism. 
Andy, uh, Councilor Barkley. Yeah, thanks for breaking it up into the components like that. We might have to consider that if we don't get grants. And who knows what sort of grant opportunities for economic reconstruction will be coming along soon, hopefully. Um, the, uh, now I forgot my, after I made my speech, I forgot my question. The, oh, I know, it's, the, it's you know, sort of a tack on at the end and another million and a half for getting the water, you know, separated water to that point. So that takes it up to about a seven and a half million dollar project. Is that, um, we would have to dig up all the road from about the substation? Is that where the water main is now? That you would have to start the separation and replace that? Is that what that? From the Prairie Valley like? substation? Yeah. No. Um, where, where would you tie into the main? Yeah, so so I guess just to, just to take a step back, so I believe it was last year we added the $1.5 million project into the water fund to, to show the upstream separation component, component. So that won't be a new item this year. And then we'll be allocating the water portion for this stretch into the water fund as well. Um, there's five locations. So there's uh, from on the between on Brown Street, uh, we installed a section of 600 millimeter irrigation main uh, when Hillcrest was put in. And so there's connecting that 600 millimeter main from there towards the roundabout at Prairie Valley. Mm -hmm. And then there's a section going on the other side um, up the hill to get to Victoria towards the oval about. So that'd be the second one. There's a PRV station at the oval about that's required. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a section then on uh, Victoria Road South from the round of, or the oval about to Dale Meadows Road that would be required. And then up at the uh, Aileen Street near the water treatment plant, there's a section of that needs to be separated up there. Um, so, and then, and then we would also um, consider replacing or looking at the condition of the main uh, a kilometer north of Harris. So if we were to go another kilometer along Giants Head Road, past Harris towards Prairie Valley Road. Uh, there's a section of six inch main along there that should be considered uh, and may need to have services uh, connected to the appropriate main to ensure separation through there as well. I thought there was uh, uh, no pipe from the, you know, from down at that Prairie Valley Road, that first redone stretch. So that's in the ground already waiting. Yeah, so there's two there's two wings there. Yeah, and when the when the roundabout and the oval boat were done, they put in the sections through there, so that section wouldn't have to be ripped up and just be tying into either side. Yeah. And then and then at the intersection of Giant's Head, it's all that nicely redone areas, pipe laying there waiting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's dual there's dual pipe right now, so that would be that would be reused. I mean, it's still a million and a half dollars. It's just won't be big enough. So I guess this is uh, food for thought for budget time, correct? That's, uh... Yeah, um, this hadn't been brought to council since it was uh, the design was awarded back in 2017, I believe. So we wanted to bring this as it's been rolling forward on the capital budget to show some options and to um, get council thinking before budget. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we could bring it forward for information. Councilor Patton, second. Anybody want to second this? Councilor Alton, uh, all in favor? Uh, carry it. Um, <clears throat> item 7.4, 2020 third quarter financial update. Uh, our director of finance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, the purpose of this report is to provide council with a, an updated financial projections uh, in light of the COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, throughout the pandemic, staff have been closely monitoring actual revenues. To see how they compare to the projections that were prepared uh, way back in uh, mid-April. Uh, based on this analysis, a revised revenue projection is being presented and uh, a summary of that is on the uh, screen right now. Overall, the revised calculations are projecting an additional $1.15 million in revenues uh, when compared with the amended budget. And that's the key, it's the amended budget. Uh, this increase is attributed primarily uh, to the water and electric utility funds not seeing uh, the large consumption decreases that uh, we had originally projected to see. Looking at the individual funds themselves, uh, the following highlights are presented for council. Uh, the general fund, 
comprises the majority of the district services and includes administration, finance, police, fire, cemetery, works, uh, and a whole bunch of others. The revised projections estimate an additional reduction in revenues of $170,931 lower than the 2020 amended budget. However, this is not as bad as it appears. The majority of external revenue, I'm a finance guy, that's about as good as you're going to get for visuals. The majority of external revenue streams are actually projected to have higher uh, year end actuals than shown in the amended budgets. Uh, the projected increase is about $500,000, $500 higher. Uh, grant funding, however, is projected to be about $257,000 lower than was provided for in the budget. Uh, this decrease is due to the district being unsuccessful in three submissions that we put, uh, we put in. Uh, with that, the corresponding expenses have also then been taken out uh, of the revised projections uh, that you see in front of you. Uh, additionally, transfers from surplus and reserves are projected to decrease $414,500. The pandemic has uh, forced the district to revise priorities over the past six months. Uh, staffing layoffs have impacted a, a number of projects uh, that could have not have been completed. So overall, uh, nine projects that were to be funded through surplus and reserves uh, are projected not to move forward uh, in 2020. So, and again, uh, with the grants, the corresponding expense line items have also been removed from the projections. Uh, prior to moving on to the utility funds, uh, there is one item I'd just like to bring forward to Council's attention. Uh, it's in regards to the measure Council implemented in order to provide some financial assistance to residents uh, by extending the property tax due date from July 3rd to September 30th. Uh, the district issued approximately 5,550 property tax notices, which totaled $17 million in property taxation. Uh, this also included uh, levies for other taxing jurisdictions, such as school tax, RUFs, uh, and the like. Uh, when we compared the uh, outstanding balances at the due dates, so July 3rd, July 3rd, I believe, of 2019, comparing that to September 30th of 2020, uh, the results were almost identical uh, within $15,000. The uh, 2019 outstanding balance was $1.435 million, and in 2020, it was $1.45 million. So the additional three months uh, overall, from the district's perspective on a cash flow basis, it didn't really affect us at all. We'll now switch gears and uh, look at the district's utility fund. So the water fund, uh, in preparation of amending the district's 2020 to 24 financial plan bylaw, council did review numerous projections and was cognizant of trying to provide financial relief to residents and businesses, while at the same time ensuring the financial viability of the water utility. At that time, council approved budget amendment that saw an overall revenue decrease of just over $640,000. Uh, monthly actuals have been reviewed and compared to those assumptions. Uh, and we have uh, revised the assumptions based on the actuals that, uh, that we've seen. Uh, these revisions will now provide the district's water utility with an estimated revenue increase of $309,860, uh, which is all surplus. The electric fund, uh, like the water fund, council reviewed numerous scenarios prior to approving uh, the budget amendment that saw the decrease uh, of revenues of at $1.4 million. Uh, monthly actuals, again, have been reviewed and compared to the assumptions that we used. And based on these actuals, we have revised the assumptions, uh, which now provide the electric utility with, uh, with a revenue increase of uh, $1 million. And that generates an overall surplus of $390,000. So to summarize, the, the intent of this report was to provide council with an updated financial picture uh, and revise revenue projections in light of the six and a half months of actual data that we've now been able to collect. 
Uh, we will continue to monitor actuals and we will be bringing forward budget amendment to council to incorporate the changes you see in front of you uh, at a later date, probably in November. And that uh, concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions for our director of finance? Director Pat. Thank you, Mr. Um, Dave, I want to, uh, you know, when this pandemic started and we sat here and we were wondering what we were going to do. And, uh, and uh, I think um, I got to commend you on your diligence because uh, through your guidance and what our numbers are showing today, um, I, it's, uh, I, I think we need to thank you for, for uh, envisioning and for uh, setting the proper path for us to make the decisions that we did that wouldn't uh, severely harm us uh, now that we're going into 2021. So I guess it wasn't a question, it was more of a, a thank you. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. I think we did well in, in balancing that um, <clears throat> desire we had to, to provide uh, pandemic relief to residents without uh, breaking the bank and putting a huge financial strain on on the municipalities, we can thank, thank all of us, <laughs> <laughs> but especially our director, uh, Councillor Van Alphen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, our last year's 2019 taxation, <clears throat> property taxes, and in this year's property taxes were pretty much the same. So, basically, hats off to the general public out there for, you know, Paying, you know, I mean, we could have been short in that area, but it looks like the public has stepped up and, you know, and paid. And um, I think that was one of the worries that, you know, we'd be a big shortfall there and it hasn't happened. So great for the public. Thank you. So if there's no other questions or comments, if someone could bring that forward for information, Councilor Van Elsen, Councilor Patton, all in favor, and that's carried. Um, item 7.5, uh, budget timeline, and our director of finance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so really the purpose of this report is just to provide council with the proposed 2021 uh, budget timeline. In all, there are seven proposed meetings to specifically discuss budget uh, rates and council priorities. The first meeting is scheduled for this uh, Wednesday uh, at one o'clock. Uh, in addition to the budget meetings, there are two public open houses scheduled uh, for December 7th and February 10th. Uh, now the format of these open houses is still being investigated uh, with COVID and not allowing us to, to meet with more than 50 people in a, in a room, which based on last year's probably wouldn't be a problem anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, once we do confirm uh, the uh, the time and, and how we're going to be bringing these forward, uh, we definitely will advise the public uh, in advance. Uh, and that uh, concludes my report. Thank you. Maybe uh, this is the year we could, uh, you know, for, we were talking about the open houses, we could take, take advantage of Current situation to to maybe uh, think of uh, be a bit more creative in how we present to the public because uh, as, as you refer to uh, open house on the budget is the, the, the most doesn't draw the biggest crowds so maybe we can find uh, different different means using technology or, or whatever. Uh, any questions? Anybody like to bring this forward for uh, to approve the uh, budget timeline? Councilor Van Elsen, Councilor Carlson, uh, all in favor? And uh, that's carried. Uh, 7.6, the Arts and Cultural Center project update, uh, Mr. CAO. Thank you, Your Worship. So this is just a brief update uh, as a follow-up to our presentation. We provide some detail on phase one renovations for the Arts and Cultural Center in June of this year. We gave uh, received some direction from Council at, after that meeting uh, to commence the Phase 1 Arts and Cultural Centre renovations and that uh, we bring back the final plans 
before going out to tender. So we've attached the plans. So again, I won't go through them in any, uh, too much detail. Uh, we provided all that information in June, but happy to answer any questions from council. The, uh, the architect is in the process of, uh, or should council support moving this forward, uh, putting the tender package together. Um, really looking to make sure there's no cost overruns, which is obviously a big part of these, these projects. So the available budget will certainly drive uh, the major components of the scope of work that's currently being proposed. Um, with a big focus, really making sure on the uh, internal portions of the building being the major priority of the uh, project and uh, project moving forward. Uh, obviously looking at doing the entire phase one uh, as budget allows. So we've got approximately $380,000 in budget uh, for this project. Uh, we're just looking for council to endorse the final set of plans. The main function of this phase one is to move the art gallery downstairs and create a multi-purpose space upstairs as you can see in the plan attached to this report. Happy to answer any questions you would. Thank you. Any questions? No questions? Uh, would you like to bring uh, a motion forward? <coughs> Councillor Carlson? I'll move the council approve the finalized scope of work for the phase one arts and cultural center renovations as contained in attachment one of the report from the CAO dated October 26, 2020. Thank you. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> Just like to say, I'm looking forward to this getting underway. It's been a long time coming. Um, all in favor? That's carried. Uh, moving on to 7.7 .7, uh, 2021 regular council meeting schedule and our director of corporate services. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, every year, council is required under the community charter to set the schedule for the regular meetings for the following year. So the schedule that's been put together in front of you today is to follow um, your past meeting schedules, which are the second and fourth uh, Monday of each month. Um, no changes have been suggested for 2021, and therefore um, it's up to council to determine whether or not they want to continue with the 1 p.m. and the 6 p.m., as well as the second and fourth Mondays. Council, any opinions on this? Council Barco? Um, good schedule for that. My only comment would be, um, so we have a meeting October 23rd, and then the next one's not until September 27th, so we're going Five weeks without a, a meeting. Um, that's quite a long. So it'd be August, yeah, August twenty third to the twenty seventh. Um, you'll note that UBCM falls in that week of the thirteenth, which would be the the normal meeting day. Um, but certainly, council could change uh, change that should they wish to have another meeting in there. I guess we can always schedule one at the time if we feel the need. Uh, would somebody like to bring a uh, motion forward to uh, approve the 2021 meeting schedule? Councilor Patton, Councilor Barclow, uh, any further discussion? All in favor? That's carried. Uh, 7.8 uh, policy updates, Director of Corporate Services. Thank you, Your Worship. So the recommendations in front of council today are with the report to do some policy updates. One is um, with regards to our council procedure amendment, which was actually reviewed by council in June, was advertised in July, and is being brought forward for final reading and adoption today. And that meeting actually did some um, realigning of the order of the agenda, and that was the discussion during the June meeting was just aligning what we actually were doing in practice with the procedure bylaw. So once this bylaw is adopted, it will be consolidated into the procedures bylaw and then posted to the website and will be current and up to date. The other two policies are policies that we've recently implemented, one of them being the electronic meetings policy that we put in place or council put in place in May of this year. 
that was the reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic and the different ways that we were looking at including the public um, participation, but also just accessibility to meetings of council when they were um, over the Zoom platform. Since that time, there have been changes and we have been um, kind of working towards how can we better do this with council and with the public. Council has directed us to look into different audiovisual equipment for council chamber. So that is still uh, a project that's undergoing right now. Um, but in the meantime, we also recognize that council now is meeting in person. Um, there are opportunities and staff has been working quite um, diligently to see how we could include members of the public to speak um, at areas similar to public hearings or other items of interest to the public. Um, when we changed the, or when council agreed in August to continue electronic or no public in attendance, that was a comment made by council was if there was a public hearing, would it be possible for council to actually have in-person attendance? So this policy is intended to update kind of our practice and what we are doing currently to allow people to register to speak either in person um, here at chamber or on the phone. And uh, also change from electronic meeting to remote participation as the people that are going to be participating with council that aren't in person could be calling in, it could be in the future, it's a computer program that we're using. So we just wanted to generalize it as a remote meeting, not on site. So that's the update to that policy. And the second policy is the council correspondence policy. This one was being updated to apply mostly to our development re related correspondence. Um, We've had one public hearing during COVID and that was held at the um, banquet, or sorry, at the arena upstairs in the banquet hall. Um, we haven't had a public hearing here in chambers and we do have one this evening. So we were looking at ways to, as I mentioned before, have members of the public here. We were looking at our notification period. We're looking at the process to get the correspondence that comes in for council for public meetings to council in an appropriate time frame, as well as to members of the public. And so the biggest change on that one is actually stating that our, our notification or the period that, that uh, council is required to ask for um, letters, uh, representation, written correspondence to come to council be 12 p.m. This would allow staff the time to put together all of the correspondence provided to council ahead of the meeting so that there is some reasonableness to the ability for council to review. It also ensures that we put all of that correspondence online so that the public who's participating or watching the meeting also has access to that. So that uh, those two policies, those are the major changes and um, certainly they'll both be having questions. I just have one for so for the public hearing tonight. How do we have people registered to appear in person? We do. And it could maybe just explain how that's going to work. Sure. So um, we still are encouraging people because we have limited space in our council chamber, as you can see. Um, we still are encouraging people to participate by phone, um, and certainly it's uh, it's an option that's available. People are watching at home; they can dial in um, and speak to council. However, this evening, we do have most of the people that have registered coming to, um, to speak in person here at uh, Council Chamber. There's, um, I believe, 10 people on the list at this point. We have two staff that are actually going to be here, stay after, and help us out. Um, one down in the lobby area and one up here. We've marked off the hallway with X's six feet apart, so people will come up the stairs, kind of queue in the hallway, come in this one door, They'll speak to council and then exit out of the other door. Um, we will be asking, of course, if there's anybody that's experiencing any COVID symptoms, if they've been out of the country, and um, again, encourage people, even if they've registered to be in person, if they're not feeling well, to certainly um, stay home and participate over the phone. Thank you. Sounds great. I think it's important that we, we do give people the, you know, the choice to, to speak in person if they wish or you know while I'm currently doing it remotely. Um, obviously we're not ready yet to have people stay and, and sit as an audience. <coughs> but, uh, if it's the way we had this afternoon for example, we need to give people the opportunity to appear in person. Okay, 
Any other questions, comments? Anybody like to bring this forward for information and everything else? Councilor Van Alphen. Okay, so, so that's it, the whole thing, your receipt for information and to adopt the uh, bylaw amendments. Okay. Second, Councilor Carlson. Uh, all in favor. That's carried. And uh, moving on to the public or media comment period. Do we have anybody on the line? Okay, no, no. Uh, so I would like a motion to uh, close the meeting to the public for uh, pursuant to sections 991C and E of the community charter to consider labor relations and or, or other employee relations and acquisition or disposition of land. Councillor Patton, second Councillor Van Alphen, in all favor. Thank <laughs> you. 